Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with yet another of the Naxos slash Vox reissues. And this one is a Lollapalooza. It's Stanislav Skrovachevsky doing Beethoven overtures and incidental music. Now, originally, this was a Vox box. I think it had three discs. I have the Vox box and two discs of like all the overtures and things. And boy, do we need to see all of it come back, come back because it is just splendid. It's marvelous. And this is a wonderful taste of the complete set. You get, you get all of the Fidelio slash Leonora overtures, all four of the suckers, plus the music from the ruins of Athens, including the overture, the Turkish march, and the, the march and chorus in E flat major. And it's wonderful with the Bach Society of Minnesota, like, you know, who cares? And the Minnesota Orchestra, and like I said, Stanislav Skrovachevsky, neatly remastered. And boy, these Leonora overtures are hot, 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 hot. Particularly number three. Oh, boy, number three is just amazing in this performance. You know, it always kind of fascinates me, you know, that people simply refuse to just let the music go go completely crazy when it's supposed to. And, you know, not all music has moments where you're supposed to go crazy, right? But Leonora number three does. It's the end of the coda. Da, 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 ba, 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 this is the performance that goes absolutely volcano ape crap crazy at that moment. Oh my God, they just slam into that dissonant chord like, like a 10-ton truck hitting a brick wall. Oh, it's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. But they're all, they're all wonderful. I mean, not all of them have moments such as that. I remember, I remember vividly not being able to figure out Leonora number two. You know, it always seemed somehow wrong to me. It had like all the stuff of Leonora number three, but only, only, only it didn't go where it was supposed to go. And then I realized, I realized why. It's because Leonora Overture number two is really an operatic prelude. It was way too long for the opera um, and it was way too developmental, but it doesn't have a recapitulation. It just, it just has a, exposition and then it develops and develops and develops and develops and develops and then this coda kicks in which is similar to the coda in number three but it's spread out somewhat differently and then it stops and you realize of course that it doesn't need to have a formal shape or finish because it, you know the opera is coming afterwards it can be a little bit open-ended but it's open-ended and like 15 minutes long which is too long to be open-ended sort of it's a weird piece and the more I listen to it, I enjoy it very much. Don't get me wrong. It's lots of fun. But the more I listen to it, the weirder it gets. You know, number three, on the other hand, is like one of the world's first tone poems, along with the Coriolan Overture. It, it is complete a complete musical encapsulation of what happens in the opera. And as the great Sir Donald Tovey pointed out, the music is so dramatic and exciting that it annihilates the first act of the opera, which is why Beethoven undoubtedly took it out. Now, some people stick it into the end of Act th Act Two, you know, as a, as a transition between the the end of the dungeon scene and the the final, you know, choral apotheosis to marital fidelity and the bravery of Leonora, and I I have no problem with that. I don't think it's necessary, but, you know, great music is its own justification. So if they want to stuff Leonora number three in the middle there, who am I to argue? I'll sit back and enjoy it. It's not a problem. Fidelio is not a terribly long opera after all. But, but I digress, right? I mean, the bottom line is that these are wonderful, wonderful performances. Now, I, I really would have liked, I, I have to confess, I would have liked, would have, forget the price issue and whatnot, if Vox had taken all of their Skrovachevsky stuff and just stuffed it into a box and released it because they have fabulous Bartok, fabulous Stravinsky, fabulous Ravel, and this Beethoven stuff and some other things. Really, really first-class performances by a, a major conductor, one who didn't get 
you know, the kind of attention that he deserved during his lifetime because he was one of those musicians' musician. You know, he was he was he was a a, a undemonstrative conductor, a modern music guy, but someone who was musical down to his fingertips and who left us some absolutely stunning work. I mean, one of the great Bruckner cycles out there and a lot of other things besides. Some great recordings he made in Halle um, in Manchester with the Halle Orchestra. But these early Skrobachevsky recordings are important and, and evidence of a really fine artist at work, a first-class musical mind. And you hear it here. Beethoven always responds well to first-class musical minds because he was himself a first-class musical mind. Not all composers were. Some of them were idiots, and you don't need a mind to perform them. But for Beethoven, it never hurts. And if you can marry a first-class musical mind to a musical impulse that's simply exciting as hell, then you've got Beethoven for the ages, and that's what this is. So I would definitely give it a shot if I were you. Um, and keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.